three, four. We get live right now, man. It's going down, excited for the season. You know, we coming off a playoff win. I mean, you know, we had a couple wins. Fifteen minute podcast, and if you know what that's in <laughs> reference to, then you're probably in the right spots. Uh, my name is Riley Feldman, one of the co-hosts of Dear Diaries, a Milwaukee Bucks podcast, presented to you by us, the staff of Brew Hoop. I'm joined by a special guest, but first, Kyle Carr. Kyle Carr is back. It's been probably over a month, right, Kyle? How, how you been since you were last on the podcast? Give or take, uh, I'm good. I had COVID, so that was not a fun time. Um, then I went to Florida. That was fun, but also very, very hot. I cannot do Southern humidity. I, that's just not in my blood. And Sterling started school last week, so that's been a weird adjustment, having a kid in 4K. So now it's actually like we have to wake up at a certain time. We have to be out the house at a certain time. Like, there isn't this... We'll get there when we get there. It's like, no, I have to leave by seven to get you to school by 730. So we we have to get moving. So it's an adjustment. But otherwise, everything's been good. And shout out Ford Madison FC there in the final of the USL Jägermeister Cup. I will explain it in more details in the future. Basically, it's just a competition that Jägermeister decided to sponsor. I don't know why, but Ford Madison's in the final. So that's been great. Good. I, I look forward to the explanation about that. I'm sure the crossover, the branding crossover makes a lot of sense from Jägermeister's perspective, uh, but it sounds like you're somewhat refreshed, at least from Buck's talk, which uh, we'll get into a little bit here. So you'll be in the right mindset for it. You know, it, it, it's it's nice having some separation from it. It was nice having a break. Um, kind of felt like I was not going to be able to contribute anything valuable if we had recorded more often. I wanted to be on some of the recordings that you did, but just timing didn't work. But I am ready. Let's do this. Awesome. Well, it's good to have Kyle back, and it's good to have yet another special guest. The best part about this whole season preview series has been expanding out beyond just the Brew Hoop staff, excellent as we are to have a couple of guests from around the Bucks podcast slash blog slash video cast uh, We're joined this week by the beautiful mind behind the Teutonia World Project, uh, better known as at David Dunn 21 on Twitter. Uh, it's Ben from Tony World. Ben, how are you doing? How's the switch to being a full time video caster going for you? If that's what's what's the technical term for your your lane now? <laughs> Boy, I think everybody knows I'm not the person for technical terms. There, there is no lane. And even, you know, it was funny, even as Kyle was kind of describing. I say this not derisively like your soccer thing, I, I always kind of wonder, like, what gives people kind of hobby fulfillment and and it seems clearly from what i occasionally see on your instagram that like what gives you kind of fulfillment is kind of i would guess the other stuff at this point hey, let, let me let me start this with a question for you guys as you know a bad idea is that so does this bucks thing make you guys happy H has it made you happy was there a time when it really made you happy is is this is is it does it tickle your fancy in that kind of way or is it just like kind of a thing that you did for a while and, or, or or what's the status or has there been ebbs and flows with that? Well, yeah, audio cut out a little bit. So is it the podcast or blogging? What was the first part of the question? Well, I mean, I mean, there's articles, there's all this stuff that I oh, kind of just like brew hoop in doing. general, J just yeah. brew hoop and this and that and kind of all the spinoffs and the stuff that you do. I mean, um, I, I would say for me, it's kind of gone in ebbs and flows just because when I first started, it was just helping out however I can. And then once that happened, then I took on the Twitter account and the social media for the 2018, 2019 season. And even though it was a really fun season, unfortunately ended in the Easter conference finals, it had just been so draining. And then I did it for another season, but with the arrival of Sterling and then it was like the pandemic, I was just like, I don't know how much more I could do of this. So I kind of just slowly stepped away from that. Then it kind of just was, I'll fill in, primarily do previews. And now it's like, I think I needed like the break of doing, of like having to yeah. commit myself. So that's like now it's like, okay, the weekly Wednesday recap was kind of like, all right, I'll try and have that be the focus. 
along with doing the pod. So I think for me, in terms of like writing stuff, I've kind of, I'm going to slowly try and get back into it. And especially as I, it sounds kind of bad, but at the same time, it's like Mitchell and Adam were always able to like handle stuff. And then Gabe had stuff and Riley, like there's so many other people that mm-hmm. could jump in and do it. That I was kind of like, okay, I don't need to like step on anyone's toes. Well, now it's like, all right, we have a newer staff and they're great and they're hitting the ground running. But at the same time, it's like, all right, as one of the elder statesmen, I should probably do something and not just be, you know, chilling at the end of the bench collecting a non-existent paycheck. So I, I think for me, it's kind of gone in ebbs and flows. And I've also realized how much my mental capacity can be before like taking on another big thing. It's kind of like, do I have time and do I have the care to do it for a whole season or at least try to do it for a whole season. Uh, I promise I won't interview you too, but R- Riley, same question. <laughs> um, it, it, it is a good question. So I was actually talking to Jackson about this. I've probably been doing this for about a decade or so being with brew hoop. Um, and I think, do I still get satisfaction out of it? I do. The, the most satisfying part about what I do is the podcast because Namely, it's it's an opportunity for me, Kyle and Adam to hang out for like an hour, hour and a half a week just to talk about whatever's going on. Like the Bucks are more so just like like a, with a lot of conversations around sports. It's just like the foot in the door to a opportunity yep. to talk and hang out with your friends or whatever. Um, and so I, I get into it like I want to continue to try to improve it or do all the SEO stuff or whatever, because because I think we have a good dynamic. I enjoy listening back to what we talk about and I want other people to enjoy that. The Bucks are just kind of like incidental. Obviously, if they win, that's a great thing. If they lose, I get uh, especially games that are like unacceptable losses or it's just extra stupid or I think the organization is doing dumb things like that still frustrates me, but it doesn't dominate my day to day per se. All, all the other stuff is incidental. Also, the fact that writing basket blogging is like, the least consumed form of interacting with basketball conversation these days. Like mm-hmm. the, the era of the written basket blog is more or less over like brew hoops on the last bastion standing really. So um, from that perspective, I've had to move and find other ways around the site to find fulfillment out of it. But the site's been good to me to be able to have that kind of flexibility, I guess. Cause the reason that I asked, and I am going to answer your question, the kind of cliche of, you know, if you, you know, if you do, if your job is a thing that you love, you never work a day like that, that kind of thing. I, I I suppose the, the opposite of that would be if you do something that you love and you make yourself hate it, then like you doubly, like you've ruined the one thing that gave you happiness for me. And if I'm even answering the question, um, I've always been a, a Wisconsin sports fan. I've always enjoyed playing sports and the, when I was younger and, and, probably like the books a little bit more than the Packers or Brewers, but bas- basically all equal Mark Marquette, but Marquette and the Badgers, the whole deal. Um, made a Jason. I don't know what made me want to make a Jason kid video a million years ago. When, when that kind of video, I, again, I feel like I've told my origin story twice, which is way too much. Um, Jason kid is driving around downtown Milwaukee in an expedition or, a, or an escalate or whatever it is. And it's just, and what is this a decade ago? I think it's like eight years ago now, or it's like a really long time. How long ago was kid? I mean, we're on the, 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 this, the, this four coaches ago, right? I mean, mm-hmm. it was 10 years ago. Cause yeah, it was just Cause he was the coach like of the 14, 15. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah it's a decade ago. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. It is more. Cause it's 2024. Let's do this, oh, Let's do this was a decade ago. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, so I like making videos occasionally. I, I, I used to, when my kids were young, you know, Kyle's kids, I, I kind of always tell everybody like document your kids when they're that age and kind of document their voice. Cause you'll remember what they look like that the voice changes, but you won't remember like their baby voice or their like toddler voice or different. And that's, that's like real special for me. So I, I didn't have as much loot when, when my daughter was younger and I overcompensated with my second child. And so I was making a lot of videos and I was like mixing them to, Hans Zimmer stuff or whatever. And so eventually it's something came up, you know, so I have a billion private videos of my kids basically done in the, basically done the same way I do books videos. And so, and this is when virality was something different, right? 
And so I made this video and Frank Madden picked it up and, and everybody retweeted it and, you know, it was going around and I, it, you can't see, I think I probably showed you, I'm sure I showed Riley a picture, but I have two kind of framed canvas pictures, which is like a compilation, but it's like on NewJersey.com. I don't know if that's still a thing, but it was on like a lot of stuff. It was on all the Milwaukee stuff, Milwaukee record. And, and obviously you guys, and I'll save my thanks for all that for you guys at the end. And so I, I occasionally, so to answer your question, I make videos sometimes because I think of a stupid, I, I more often than not think of a stupid joke that I would like to see implemented. And if I could just subcontract somebody out to make that, that joke, I wouldn't have to make it. Um, sometimes there were, there were, there are times where I, there are some videos that are kind of more essays and there's some things that I take more seriously. Um, but COVID started. So we did a last dance podcast and I'll just keep weaving through all of this that Riley's been on the pod multiple times. Kyle's been on the pod multiple times. Both of you guys have helped me out with the kind of award show, which was crazy labor of love kind of stuff. So niche sort of content, content that you hope other people like, but content that's basically for you. And do I find, I'm a very happy person, but do I find fulfillment in my job? Not so much. And, but my job allows me to kind of daydream a little bit. And so I'm always date. So if I'm listening to podcast, if I'm listening to you guys at work, I'm listening to the winning six guys. I'm listening to the locked, I listen to all these kind of things and listen to Simmons and all this kind of stuff. After a while, the back of your mind starts putting together a puzzle that you don't know that it's doing. Cause you're not, you know, getting your TPS reports out or whatever, isn't like really doing it for you. And so your brain, so you hear one piece of music over here, or there's something else. And all of a sudden you're like, at least for my brain starts putting stuff together. So for a while we had a podcast, I thought the podcast was really successful and really fun. And we did a ton of top fives. And, um, I think Riley was on like the, the James Bond musical, ep like we were doing James Bond musical episodes and like, and Kyle is like, you got to see the Heights. And so it's like, we did the Hamlet, like we did all kinds of crazy episodes, top five Marvel. And again, this is the podcast era. So anything as if you're listening to this and say, well, that doesn't sound that great. It was kind of fun to interact with the format. And after a while with the changes in Spotify and everything else, I, I said, well, I, if I, if they're taking down all my music, so basically, and there's stuff you don't even remember doing, but like you'd get like some takedown notice from using Marvin Gaye in 2019 or something like that, because mm -hmm. the AI, the, you know, Skynet found you a and it just, I think I still have like the masters or whatever, but like, I think the James Bond episode got taken down. A lot of stuff got taken down. So that was the idea. Well, I'll move to YouTube. And of course, like my fourth episode on YouTube, I put up like, just as a joke, as I'm, as it's two in the morning and I'm editing, I put up like that Australian break dancer, Ray gun chick or whatever else. And then that, that got taken down after like, a, after like an hour. So, 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 the pirate radio aspect of me just kind of doing whatever I want is what makes it fun. It's not, you want everything you do to blow up. Very few things blow up, but you just kind of, I've enjoyed kind of charting my own course with, with all of this. And that's kind of what, so I don't even know if that answers the question, but that's kind of how, that's how it ended up being completely just YouTube. And there'll still every once in a while be essays and there'll still every once in a while be bucks preview or recap videos. But you know, I do a video maybe every three months. Yeah. I think a lot of that makes sense. And that's, I, I like the idea of using it as the, the outlet, like you said, same sort of process. I'll be listening to whatever podcast and you're like, Oh, that's a good idea. Or that's an interesting point. Or I think that's a stupid point. And you may not, you know, you're more willing to kind of give a shout out to whoever, whether it be local or national to be like, Oh, I was listening to whomever. And they said this and I, you know, I reacted this. I don't do that so much on the podcast, but the ability to have a space and it's called, not being the podcast attached directly to Vox, which we haven't really explored all that much, but the fact that you're hmm. able to do things more expansively, we could. I mean, we kind of have kind of just done the same thing we've done always, but I think there's more room for having a discussion like this, for example. Like, is it technically brew who bucks focused? I mean, there's going to be aspects of that as we talk, but it's not strictly what happened in the week before, or let's run through these questions. I think there's a lot of room there. So it's, I think it's kind of an interesting place where this podcast is. It's not the exact same as yours because you obviously, like you said, it encompasses a wider range of things that you are interested in. But um, I kind of understand, you know, I, I have a similar feeling when it comes to, you just want a place to have your creative outlets as silly as it is for something as like, you know, I don't want to call basketball silly because it isn't, but you know, no. in the grand scheme of things, but, but, but even in the middle of the playoffs and then tell, let me know if you guys are the same way. 
if I listen to you guys fourth, because there's been some buzzer beater or something like that, the movie reviews and the pen and the pen reviews and all that kind of stuff is what like I, I you know how you like you, if you listen to a podcast and then you pause it or rewind, go back five minutes and you're like I didn't really hear any of this, and so if I listen to you guys first after a game or just whatever, then I'm going to get that, that. That's when it's fresh. By the time I listen to my fourth Bucks podcast at work, I'm not really listening to them describing the bad foul, but I am re- going to remember when you guys talk about your vacations or whatever. And so if I interact with it in that way, I would only assume, especially because people don't agree with any of my sports takes, which, you know, <laughs> the, I do feel like people stick around for, you know, the Chris Middleton quiet storm or just other kind of wacky stuff that we're, that, because I, I I imagine I know there's people who hate all the uniform stuff and all the sports takes and, and stick around just because it's bizarre, or hateless or whatever. So that that was that's kind of the idea. You try to make the, th- the kind of thing you want to listen to. Yeah. OK, enough shop talk. Let's get into the let's get into the real meat and potatoes here about why why we invited <laughs> To tone your world, the Dear Diaries crossover. I'm going to start throwing questions at these guys. We're going to see where it goes. The whole idea was to do the season preview series of questions, but I felt like a little, not not a waste per se, but given such a, a wide variety of interests that both of you guys have and a little bit of crossover like you were just talking about, uh, felt appropriate to throw these at you guys. So we'll start here and see where it takes us. Uh, we'll have you answer first, Kyle, so that our guest has some time to think about it. At what level of, ba- uh, at what level is basketball further furthest, geez, from its platonic ideal, the three levels being prep, college, and pro? So when we're saying prep, are we just saying high school or are we saying like AAU? I was thinking AAU. I don't know where that's that my answer went. then. Okay. Because that's, that's a, my that's answer. That's a great answer. If that's, that's, I didn't even think of that's a great answer. Because my view is with high school and like playing in high school, it was very clear different schools and different regions were going to have different play styles. Like I went to Waukesha North. We were running the Bo Ryan swing offense. It is not pretty, but it would get the job done. And then you would go to Arrowhead, and because they had Ben Mills, who was a 6'11 dude that was taller than everyone on the court, it was pretty much just give him the ball, let him work the post, and you just hack him and hope for the best. And then you're going over, and you're playing Milwaukee schools, and it's like different systems because they just have different athleticism, and it was just like, or you play like a Sussex or Muskego, and it's just three ball, Germantown's three ball. Like I felt like high school at least had its own identity depending on the school while with AAU it's like they're not really coaching they're not really doing it it's just a be- it's more iso can this can your best players beat their best players in one on one and that's what i kind of feel like that's also it's funny cuz people talk about like oh there's like no american superstar anymore like the best players are all these guys from canada and the united states and f- not the united states canada and europe and even occasionally also like but we don't have like the best American player right now might be Anthony Edwards, like the best young one. Mm -hmm. And it might be Anthony Edwards and who is really, really good. But it's like, when you're thinking then it's like, all right, otherwise it's like Jason Tatum, Jalen. Like it's a lot of guys that are like, none of them scream superstar, like best player, like best player, even at their own position. And I think a lot of it is because AAU, it's just like, yeah, we're just, there is lack of coaching. There's lack of structure. It's the same thing with, even soccer and I think baseball it's like we've gotten away from like coaching aspect so I would say AAU but isn't isn't that ironic though that in a country where basketball is such a popular sports we're at the grassroots level the way that it is played at least you know generalizations about AAU is so out of step or seems to be producing players that are out of step with like things that tend to work in basketball or that we think, you know, like you're saying, think of all these international stars. You you denote on them certain play styles that you don't on like your typical AAU American player. Isn't it ironic or strange in a way that like where did that disconnect? Is it that pressure from the top down from previously the college game? Now that's dissipating a little bit, but that top down, that path, trying to establish that path to the pros no matter what, is that just what's affecting it? I'd be curious for you guys' thoughts on that. I think it's a big part of the game, but it's like, it's not just the cherry on top. It's the cherry and the whipped cream and the nuts, but it's like, that's like, like, I think maybe you're, maybe you're going to get around to asking about player podcasts. Like it, even if you don't like every player podcast, like they have these dialogues about 
in practices how great Rashid Wallace was or just kind of and, and people are people are constantly just fa- I almost feel like it's bait at this point. People are just so fascinated by how differently NBA players can think about guys who are very good or in the case of Kobe, Great or Iverson, but they look at them like these godlike figures. Well, that's all it's AAU because I mean, it's like, it's like a different sport. It's like, you know, I I don't even know how to describe it. Like it's a big part of the game and it became like the only part of the game. And it's because I'm older than you guys. It was like when and one kind of took over when, when street ball had like its five year moment and all of a sudden like street ball was kind of bigger than the NBA. And it was like, Oh, this is like the, you know, they carry and they take five steps and there's all this, and you can kick the ball and there's all this artistic license. But like this other art form, like kind of took over basketball and like in its place, it's like super awesome. But like, so to answer the question, the, my plat, my platonic ideal of what it should be is international basketball, because I think the older you get, you want a little bit more toughness and people bouncing off each other, but it, everything is just balance. I love all that stuff. I love all that ISO ball stuff. And I, like, like Kyle said, I like different styles, which is another, which is why the answer can't be the NBA. Uh, because because everything is is just you know pace and space five out that that, that sort of thing but I, I just think it, the nba is out of balance but i was never ever 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 the guy who was like high school ball or women's basketball or any of this is like the real basketball i kind of like every aspect of it i just get cranky and older and just want stuff to be more in balance but i think the thing with like nba and like the everyone just space out five out it's like they saw what Golden State was doing. It was like, yeah, we can just replicate that. It's like, no, well, no, you can't. Because in order to replicate that, you need the arguably the greatest shooter to ever play and someone else that is really, really top 10 greatest shooter of all time as well. Like, you need two generational types of players and a guy like Draymond Green who could do a little bit of everything to cover up whatever cracks. And not a lot of teams are going to be able to do that because you're not going to get generational shooters like Steph and Clay. And I think that was like, I think everyone went overdrive into that because they're like, okay, this seems to work. But at the same time, it's like, it's only working because they have the personnel. And I think now it's starting to get back to that balance along with the salary cap and along with players just having more reasons to stay with their team and not team up and make super teams. So I think that also, I think it's starting to get back to be more balanced, but I think because there's such a stretch where everyone's like, we'll just replicate what Golden State's doing, yeah. but you can't just replicate that. And there's there's two problems at the NBA level. There's that stark example, and then there's the league itself twisting and mending its rules and the way it calls fouls and things like that, that benefits, pushes in that direction because it was the new hotness for however long, whereas... And another question I have, we can kind of shoehorn it in. It's, it's, I have this started with the question, you know, does this still bring fulfillment to you talking about the Bucks, podcasting about the Bucks, writing about them? Um, and sports in general don't bring me all that much fulfillment anymore. And I, I can't tell, it's probably mostly because I'm getting older, but there's parts of basketball where you watch it. And like we were saying at the international level, the physicality is what's missing. Like of the major sports, obviously football, American football has no, no, no equal when it comes to physicality, but basketball, like there's a, there's a balance. We're talking balances again, this balance between like, everybody says, oh, 2003, 2004, like everybody's scoring 80 points and it's just the most ugly basketball, aesthetically ugly basketball, um, because it's so physical and it feels like the NBA has missed out on the fact that it is a physical sport and guys are still physical today. It's just in a very different way. That's why Giannis is so unique because it's like, he's one of the dinosaurs still walking around, except he's, you know, still 29 years old. And so that's what I kind of think is, is missing the boat. Like the ability, like you said, Kyle, to copy what the warriors did is so limited. And yes, it was great what they did. Like, awesome to watch on like a objective level, but that's not going to carry things long term. I, I just don't find it as interesting. The The thing you want when you're watching basketball is see two guys, Giannis line up with whomever and say who's going to, it, it kind of goes back to the, the AAU one-on-one, but I want to see like Giannis or his equivalent on the other team try to like physically dominate the game in whatever way. Maybe it'll work sometimes, maybe it won't, but that's that's what's compelling. That's what's poetic. That's what's 
almost romantic to see this challenge of this guy against this guy or this this team scheme and we're just going to find a way the will to win in a way that's different than I think from three point shooting per se. Like, I don't know if, if that's in the right direction, but that's kind of how I feel whenever I think about basketball. And, and if I can just get back in real quick, just to say, this is where, I mean, obviously we're big haters on how the Celtics season worked out, but that's where the Tatum discourse went because there's this under the there's this under the surface bubbling resentment for volume shooting and for like so it, you mentioned american football like every game there's a should they kick the field goal should they go for it and no one agrees and it's kind of great but you feel the pressure of all of that and i think basketball high level basketball at the best is I would say just I would say about half of the guys in the league have have like an unguardable shot, like in a vacuum. Like it's not like people say, well, this is an unstoppable move. That's an unstoppable move. There's a million unstoppable moves, but it's like, okay, there's two minutes left. What are we really going to try to do? And it used to be when I was growing up. And yes, I have rose colored glasses about it. But if you grifted for a foul, it really might be a pick six the other way. You could Mm -hmm. throw up your arms and they might just go back the other way and dunk. And so the guys are trying to figure out, oh, can I really sell this file? Is it worth, you know, I'm Scott Williams. Is it worth, I I do think Scott Williams probably did try to take Iverson out a little bit, but there's all these like little, there's stakes to the, I mean, that's why Olympic basketball is so fascinating because when it comes right down to it, it's like, it's not even just the hero ball stuff. It's just like, Hey, what are we going to do? And the resentment against Tatum, Tatum, probably it's not super duper his fault but i think people were just like i don't want to watch a guy who just shoots every time because he's supposed to i'd much rather all of a sudden be like wow devin booker you're really like fitting into this mold way i kind of i i don't i don't particularly like you or i don't particularly like Embiid, but wow these guys are fitting the mold and it becomes more like the sports movie thing and and so i don't think there's any drama in anything but certainly in sports without people being like the coach should have did this. He didn't do this. The player took that shot that that was selfish. You know, Portis, you missed it. You're selfish. You made it. You're a hero. Like all of that stuff is like why we watch. Right. And, and, and that was just taken out of the game for shoot a three, you miss it. Shoot a three. It doesn't matter how many we make. We're just going to get them all up. I'll, I'll, I'll condense my answers. I'm sorry, but I just want to say that also. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting place. I would say because, the NBA, what is so to the original question is at which level is it furthest from its ideal? It, it, I also like college basketball, it's not an original take. The fact that it's just a regional sport, I mean, it's just going the way of the MLB, it doesn't help everything that's going on with NIL and everything. Um, so pro has to continue to be the ban- the standard bearer, and the product is entertaining in some ways, but they've done so much to dilute it, which again is kind of like a <laughs> Um, we're aging into old man takes, but it does feel a little diluted. I'm not sure like there was all this talk years ago about like, oh, the NBA leading leads all sports leagues and and social media impressions. And, you know, with this Uh age group, the younger age group. And I just wonder what is that translating into realistically? Like, were we just living in the era of loose monetary policy and having huge social media impressions was just like, a good thing. Like it's just there was nothing else past that, but it was like the idea of it was good. And now we'll just turn to Saudi and Emirati oil money, I guess. That's the next frontier. So something tells me that push in that direction. I mean, it's still paying off because the networks have to cough up to keep themselves alive. They have to keep something on the TV. But how long does that go for? And again, did that shift of 10 years ago? stick to anything what did what was the result i really i I I really can't say i feel like this is basically asking the other question you had which is are we is there like a real crisis coming down the pike for major american pro sports i feel like that's what you're kind of segueing into trying to a little yeah well i'll take i'll jump on it Um, it. in terms of that i think i think the biggest problem is Everyone wants to find a way to compete with the NFL, and that's just never going to happen in America. Like, you're not competing with the NFL. So you have to make it so that it's when you have your time, how are you going to get people to care about your stuff? Major League Baseball, I think the problem is it's very, very regional. Baseball was always regional, and it was not a TV sport. 
it kind of it always felt like that's where you listen on the radio. That's where you're going to the game or you listen on the radio. And this is really where old man me comes in. It's like I feel like that's the thing with baseball hockey. It's just too homogenous and also goes the same time as the NBA. So it's kind of like you got one section that's like I'm going to watch basketball and you got the other section like I'm just going to watch hockey. And there's little overlap that happens for most people. And then obviously NFL's king. Like you go to any media, ESPN, Fox, NBC, NFL's going to get the most ratings. NFL's going to get the most attention. NFL's going to draw people in because everyone, no matter what other sports you care about, everyone seems to have some connection to the NFL, whether even if it's just your own team. But there's always that driving aspect. And then, you know, it's like, for major league soccer, it's kind of like, okay, how do we try break into this? And it's like the problem with major league soccer is just a weird set concept because it's not an American concept of a sport and how the top leagues over in Europe and South America operate. It's never going to, it doesn't translate to the U S because that's just not something people are used to. So then they're trying to make it like American. It's like, all right, we're going to have a playoff. Okay. But every team makes the playoff. So it doesn't care. We have a salary cap. Well, now team's going to have to just, get rid of their best players left right and center you can't build a dynasty you can't build a team that everyone wants to root against or root for and I, I think and like the convoluted rules so i think that's the problem is everyone wants to be the nfl but you can't be the nfl i i do think and i, I know i'm oversampling for the olympics Here, here's what happens too guys when you get older you think you know how to fix stuff Right. And again, I I just keep saying this, like AJ, AJ Green, AJ Johnson, whichever the AJs we have or Marjan or any of these guys, like I wish them well, man. You know, if one of them isn't trying hard or is or whatever, like I I no longer identify with them in the same way. But I know I feel like the NBA should wear all throwbacks for the entire playoffs and their shoes should have to match. That's like an idea that I came with, like, like the marketing side of my brain is like, how would I make this better? How would I do this and that? And and. I watched the Olympics and because it was because I always have Peacock for some reason, I've had Peacock for two reasons, years, for whatever reason, I'm watching women's three on three and enraptured because it's on. I wouldn't have looked for it at all. They take the ball where they make it and they take the ball right out. And it's almost like this weird like speed chess. And I'm like, this is dope. I'm into it. And it's kind of and again, like there's there's a tension to but I watched it because it was on. And I do not talk politics at all. But if a strong man or woman emerged and was like, we're taking back this, we are exercising imminent domain. Because I bet you, Kyle, I would watch hockey, which I've never watched in my life, except like maybe on a date when I was 18 or something. But I've never seen a game. And But if it was on, if there was, and again, I'm not really asking for the standardization because I, I think part of Riley, what you're saying is like, did capitalism like save sports right up until it ruined it? Is that just the cycle, like, like a capitalistic cycle? I just, I just really feel like everybody has an app like Amazon. There's all these big pie. There's all these robber barons. There's all these people. Like I understand like the, the marketplace, but we should on some level demand the standardization, which made like which made all of us love sports because it, because it was on. And I, I haven't watched a Brewers game. I haven't watched a non-Brewers playoff game in forever because it's not on and it's not easy for me. But I might waste an hour of my night on YouTube at, scrolling as I go to sleep or on Reddit or whatever else because it's right there with me. And as we get lazier, like I, I just need sports to be accessible. And, and I think, yes, I think you're generally right that, that football is king, but I think football is king because we know that it's on. Yeah, yes, it's once a week. I think they're, they're, capitalism, again, is starting to try to ruin that by having it be every day. And so I, I'm not even sure I'm right about any of this, but the older you get, you're like, how would I fix it? What would David Stern do, right? Or what would what would somebody else do? And you start thinking about stuff in that, in that kind of terms. And I, my eyes were open with the Olympics because I don't really care about gymnastics, but all the other stuff, like I was watching the javelin and the shot put and all of this kind of stuff. It was right on my app. I punched it up. I didn't have to go to true TV or any of this other kind of stuff. And I bet you if, if I had a college basketball experience like that, I'd like it because the stuff that I have on in the background now is a lot is not compelling sports, but it's just easier. 
Yeah, and this will be it'll be really interesting watching the death, the final death throes of the regional sports networks. Like, what's the pivot there? Because League Pass mm-hmm. has been one of the worst products any major media company has put out for years and years and years. It, I've been paying for it for over a decade, and it has been god awful every single year. I, there's not all the time. A, <laughs> there's not a single. If it goes to an ad break and it tries to bring me back, the stream will be broken, and I have to reload from the start all over again. It is infuriating the product that the NBA puts out there. So once the Valley Sports, the whatever they're called, the Diamond Sports, whatever the hell they're called, when they all finally die, because it's happening. That's much like regional newspapers are going to go away eventually. What does the NBA do? Because is it just going to be? muzzle loading sh- shoving it down into mba or league pass and saying hey here you go is it more like the pivot to amazon what's that shift going to be and the, not even a problem with basketball but like talking about availability you know this whole latest round of media deals that they went through i mean you know you hear okay this this network gets this piece of pie this ne- network gets this this gets this and all it sounds to me is it's going to be a huge pain in the neck for me outside of like the couple once we get into January, the ABC games on the weekend and because I don't have cable and like occasionally I might if I watch the TNT OT, the behind the backboard uh, mm-hmm. AI mm-hmm. camera, mm-hmm. Th- those are my options for watching basketball games. If it's not bucks, because I just can't deal with league pass. And and so you hear all this is like, oh, OK, you know, great for the players. It's great for ownership for the dollars and everything. But for me as a consumer, it just sounds like it's going to suck. I don't know. It, like it's well, just more of the same. That's just going to be hard to find. And that was like one of the reasons why I was able to become such a big Bucks fan is because I could just yep. watch it on UPN. It was mm-hmm. on UPN. It was on a, the local channel 24. That was easy to watch. So I knew most of this. And I mean, that was basically the regional sport channel. And because the Bucks weren't good, they weren't playing on ESPN. It's like I can just put on that channel. I can watch it in my own bedroom. And when they're playing out West at 10 a.m., 10 p.m., I can have that on before I fall asleep. So I think there was that aspect of it as well. And like Ben was saying, like the NFL, it's like, you know, they play on Sunday. Occasionally they'll play on Monday. And now it's like, okay, the occasion will be a Thursday, Friday, whatever. But it's like, you know, they're playing on Sunday. You know, college football is happening on Saturday. You know, NASCAR, Formula One, that's going to be a Saturday, Sunday time. Like it's easy while with the NBA, all these other sports because it's larger. But I agree. Like, I don't know what's going to happen once like Bali sports goes down the drain because I don't have cable and I'm not. I can't get league pass to watch the Bucks because I'm in the market. So I'm like, uh, mm-hmm. we'll hope for the best. It's yeah, the that... most, it's the most memento aspect of my life. I feel like Homer Simpson or some TV idiot where literally a dozen times a year, I'm like, Oh yeah, I don't have ESPN. And I, and then I delete it. I get mad and, <laughs> and I make a joke or a sideways comment to my wife and, and <laughs> you know, we laugh and, Oh, you did, you know, your rise made you mad or somebody. Well, I, I, I have no, I have no, association with why I have what streaming network and and then I just forget and and somebody uh, I, I don't watch the pirate streams or anything although th- then invariably somebody on Twitter sends me a pirate stream I don't click on it um and, but and, and you watch the TNT or you just follow via Twitter or you see we're already up 15 and don't and don't worry about it and then another Thursday night comes around for my league pass or or my NBA yeah my NBA my league pass and it just rents and repeat. And another mm-hmm. Thursday night comes around. And I'm like, oh, the Bucks are, Bucks are playing uh, the Knicks. So that'll be kind of good. And, and then I don't have the game. And it just, do I go to a bar? Well, that's $80 for my family. So then you have that conversation. Well, you know, the $80 that I was going to spend for a family of four to do that. Do I, you know, do I go to a bar from, by myself to watch? Now it's in the second quarter. I just got home from work. <laughs> and to, 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 but, but like the first game, I think we play the Knicks like really early. Uh, like game three, like Lillard had a big kind of close to one of those games. And it was like, yeah, I was, go- of course, I want to see game three of, of Dame Lillard against the Knicks. And it's, it's just, I don't know. So if somebody, and if somebody said to you, Kyle, $2,500, we'll call it the diamond platinum executive package. We're, we're cutting through like, like the old cable box, like the cable box time Warner hookup back in the day. If bra man came to your door, but like, if this was <laughs> official, I'm, it, it, was, it was like an official thing. And it was like, no, 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 my guy, we got everything. We got everything. It's channel one, two, three, four, five. It's a box. It's a box. And everything is on there. Amazon. We got Hulu. We got every channel. Like at a certain point, 
I could talk myself into being that's only two hundred dollars a month, but I, I want what I want, and I, I don't believe in American exceptionalism or whatever. But like at a certain point in America, like you were used to just kind of getting what you want. You know, the Cowboys were on, the Packers were on, this stuff was on, and and it's at, at this point it's just too much to me. It, it feels very a la carte at this point. Like everything is a la carte because it's like, and I use. I'm going to go back to soccer because, like, if you want to watch a European soccer league, it's like, all right, if you want to watch German soccer, you need ESPN+. Plus. If you want English soccer, you need NBC slash Peacock. If you want Italy, you got to go to Paramount. If you want France, you got to go to BN. And good luck with that because if there's anything that's worse than league pass, it's BN. And it's like, you got to basically, if you want to watch these leagues, you're going to have to just pick and you're pretty much at the point. It's like, well, I'm paying as much as I would with cable, but also I'm not because at least, you know, ESPN is plus is whatever the Disney bundle is like 10, 12, 13 dollars. Paramount's like eight bucks. Peacock's like seven bucks. And it's still, and at the same time, it's like, it kind of feels like, oh, it's this all a car. And that's why I feel like it's going to shift to. And it's ironic because you're saying like, oh, I don't have ESPN. It's like, well, if you have direct TV, you also don't have ESPN right now. Yeah, <laughs> so it's <yeah>. like, <laughs> and, and it's always changing. It's always changed. It's not, there's nothing you can do. It's not, it's not like we were just choosing janky companies. They're all Titans. They're all Titans of it. Like they're Titans of industry to the point that I don't know how I have HBO. I forget who AB, HBO is bundled with now or max or whatever, but they're all, they're all the biggest and the best. Right. And it's just, they're all fighting with each other. We're, we're not like doing the boost mobile version of sports. There just exists no marriage between TNT and all these different entities and all these different competing concerns and I think you're going to ask about gambling later, but like none of this is particularly good for the sports fan. It's all, I feel like we're just complaining a lot, but yeah, I, it, it just, it, to me, it's, it could be better. It's, that's on brand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that's, that's why I wanted, we tried to do a pretty positive spin on most things around the yeah. bucks and basketball when we do. So it, it's good for us to have the opportunity to kind of complain about the wider stuff. I was going to, so the thing going to the point of like, if you could just have the black box of sports and it has everything, I, I even I asked my brother after I think you brought it up in your last video. I brought it up. My brother's like, how much would you pay a month if like you could just get everything? He was like, I don't know, like one hundred seventy five dollars. I said, sounds about right, like two hundred dollars. And I wonder, like with the pressure of gambling in the US, how much and I have no idea about any other international media market. I don't know how it works in the UK, like places where sports gambling has been legalized for a lot longer than it has been here and how their media networks work. But is there is it just eventually once the networks run dry, however that looks like the larger networks, the Titan networks, that is how, maybe they never do. Who knows? But do we just get the push then the consolidation in that the casinos run everything? Is that what the is that what the end state is that we're heading towards so that they can have the sports book? You have the hundred TVs. They have everything and they already do right now. But, you know, make it easier for them if they also have the black box of sports. And that's it's, just, it's everything right there. Is gambling going to get us the black box of sports? Is that do I need to be helping out my local sports book to make that happen? Maybe. I don't know, because on the one hand, every like gambling is basically just integrated in everything, like from fantasy football to ESPN as a whole column of ESPN bet and Everyone's just openly talking about it because I feel like with gambling, it was always like a taboo thing. If you take away the taboo that it's like, okay, it's not that big of a deal. It's going to be like eventually like with marijuana, it's like, okay, it's not that big of a deal anymore. Like it used to be a big deal because it was like this forbidden thing, this taboo thing. And then it got more and more legalized. I was like, okay, cool. You smoke weed, whatever. I feel like that's going to be the same with gambling. It's just going to eventually get legalized kind of like everywhere else. It's going to be like, all right. Yeah, so Potawatomi is going to have the thing. MGM Grand is going to basically be its own conglomerate, and I think that's how I view it. It's like once it stops getting less less and less taboo, it's just going to not matter as much. But then the second problem is the gambling addiction is very, very bad, and that's mm -hmm. the aspect that I don't know. I don't know if we have the answer for that. Like, okay, if we're going to make gambling so commonplace – like we do with alcohol, like we do with marijuana, like we do with all these other things. Do we have a plan to handle the addiction side of it? Because I don't think we do. Because uh, we've already seen like how people just message athletes on social media. Like I think there was a tennis player during the US Open that said like, 
I literally had someone message me saying like, oh, you cost me this money. It's like, bro, I am just trying to do my job. And you're over here complaining about a bet that you made. That's on you. The, the trouble, though, with gambling as somebody who does not do sports gambling and I, I generally I'm living, I live, I don't really care. It's the, the fact that it will, because of the nature of it, not even the people putting the bets, but the people bankrolling it, it bends everything in the sport towards or even not even in the sport. I mean, you can talk about concerns about like any sort of inside job or whatever. It's a little too conspiratorial minded, but it's out there. But the everything, the ecosystem around it bends towards it because that's the newest revenue stream, right? That's the latest, the again, the new hotness. That's that's the concern is like as things consolidate, as we continue to move further and further away from like whatever previous discussion there was about basketball towards a more gambling focus, that just it hurts the consumer who isn't a gambler. But mm -hmm. then you get into this balance of how many consumers of sports are just the gamblers versus just like Joe Schmo, Riley Schmo sitting at home on a Tuesday on February <laughs> on a, on a road game against the Orlando magic. Like it, I just worry about that as well. Like that's the, the pernicious thing about gambling to me. It's, I mean, obviously the, the addiction stuff, but for me as a non gambler, that that's the concern. I almost think the addiction stuff is like fifth on the list. Like it, it, as much. So Think about how crazy it is that I knew every single name in the Donaghy scandal. And when whatever kind of local, I forget if he was a cop or a FBI agent or whatever guy, like did a book tour and he was on Levitard and he was on all these. And there's some guy who did like, was it a Philadelphia cop or something? He, I think feel like he was a Philadelphia journalist and he was like investigating the mob. And then later on, he did like the Donaghy book. It's like Sean Michael Patrick, or it's a slightly Irish name. It's something like that. Anyway, we knew every name involved with that scandal. And now I couldn't tell you the name of the, the, the NBA players. I only know the NBA players because they're related to what's his name from the Nuggets, which I did not know. Uh, um, the third best player on the Nuggets. I don't remember any names in off season. Uh, uh, what's his name? Anyway, his brothers got had the gambling scandal oh. last year, right? Um, Big Mike yeah. Porter Jr. Is that who it is? The well, yeah, Porter brothers. Yeah. So, so it was another yeah. Porter, right? There's like three yes, Porters, yep, and, exactly. and we didn't know that. And one of them is like a a, a dirty podcaster, and one of them is whatever else, right? <laughs> and um, <laughs> and those dog those stories came and went, right? It's almost like the days of like before NIL where like these college scandals, I listened for like three years on Levitard about like the story of the booster who went to federal prison. It's like mm -hmm. something Shapiro for the hurricanes. And it was like these big stories, these big like journalism, like Mike Ryan or these like uh, Bob Lee on ESPN, these big like sober Sunday morning shows. Um, so that's that's the one aspect of it is like it's not even just us. us. I don't gamble, by the way, I should get that out here. But it's not just like the local. I think on some level downstream, it's just a numbers game that on some level. You will have suicides and other terrible things associated with your sports. You will have divorces. You will have families ruined directly related to the gambling. But I think even the gambling thing. So the financial thing from gambling is the question, which is the real thing. But I don't. So I don't want to blow past that. But I don't feel like the myth making for children has been has been on autopilot or non-existent for the last 20 years and i think about this especially in regards to baseball which i really really love but was still like my third or fourth favorite sport but there was so much myth making when i was growing up in regards to baseball angels in the outfield you know james earl jones so we're over pour one out for a real one and uh you know for the love of the I, I, all these names are like merging for the love of the game and whatever one where Kevin Costner's in the field and, and every there, there's some beautiful, beautifully shot James Horner score Americana baseball. They told you that baseball was a million things. It was also 
um, Wesley Snipes and, and, and there's every version of it, every version of it. Like they, they, they sold us what baseball was, that baseball was more like football's America's game, but baseball's Americana and, and baseball's timeless and baseball, there's no clock and a baseball game could theoretically, it's like two points on the map. It's like North and South. They never touch all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so like we're older, man, but like kids buy that stuff or like a certain percentage of kids buy that stuff. And you need like, you, you can't have the kids start cynical. Like what kind of crap is that? Right? <laughs> like you have to have them start being wide eyed. And, and I think not, so the gambling, and yes, you can say it was fantasy. Cause I think this started with fantasy, but it, it fundamentally affects our relationship with the players where we view the players now before I demand the players play hard so that my bucks win. And now if I'm demanding that they, that, that, you know, Chris is under three turnovers or whatever. So I hit my parlay on like Chris under three turnovers and, and Portis under 12 bad shots or whatever. <laughs> Portis, Portis point, point five ejections or not. Right. And, and, <laughs> and so like, that's, that's like just a different thing. And on some level, and again, because I think people know, even though I don't know, I have a little bit of a checkered reputation on these here interwebs, but clearly for my videos, like I'm a bit of a romantic about a lot of this stuff. And I just think like sports is really, really cool. And it like ties us into the nostalgia of us being younger when we're like, well, my knees and back didn't hurt. And so you got to start kids out. This is myth making. This is Disney level, like old school Disney level myth making. And the gambling. One more thing. Sorry, one more thing. Riley, you were on with me and you asked a really dope question right before the bubble. And we talked about, to make this G-rated, if the nocturnal activities of the bubble, like how much how much of the, like we were talking about where the media's in there. And then immediately after all that happened, like there were like somebody got a girl into the bubble and I forget what it was. And it was like this whole thing because like there was like the CD TMZ level of basketball and how in the bubble was that going to mix where basically like there's different layers. There's like an adult layer of considering the NBA, like who's Dame Lillard's girlfriend, all that kind of stuff. And then there's kind of a medium level and then there's a normie level and then there's a childish level. And the childish level of sports to me needs to be protected. And gambling is just one more way in which, cause like you said, it, it, it's, it's, it's just dollars at this point. But all the, also all the statistics say that kids don't care about sports the same kind of way. And so there's, it, there's a crash coming because if the next generation cares more about video games, like the thing is over. Can player podcast save us? Can Jeff Teague save us? Kyle, do you, do you think Jeff Teague can save us? <laughs> oh, he's, he's muted. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, okay. <laughs> I think the thing with player <laughs> podcast, it sounds like a good idea and concept. But we also have to remember that these players still have a massive ego. So they're not going to necessarily have people on or do things that are going to make them look bad and hurt their ego. Like that's the whole thing with Patrick Beverly's podcast is he has this dude on here that no one really cares about. And no one's going to quite like he can say whatever he wants. But Pat Bev, it's, it's his show. Mm -hmm. Like Jeff Teague is a great storyteller, but you're also not like Jeff Teague's probably the only one that can like make fun of himself. Mm -hmm maybe shannon sharp but that <laughs> sorry that was not i did not mean that considering what happened with shannon sharp lately but i think it's like most players have an ego and they're not going to want to get their ego damaged what, what happened with so, shannon no, what happened with shannon sharp he was doing some adult <laughs> actions on instagram live and he was not hacked you know the conspiracy on that again i i tell i sorry so so before we got on the mic i said okay no no hot topic yeah, then, yes and then you're, you're leading us into it okay and, and then I'm, it. I'm acting like i don't know what that story is um do you find that you like teague a little bit less because i found him i i wasn't mad at him but i do find it's just too much like all of this stuff it, it's too much to me i found and I, I don't i don't think i've ever listened to a player podcast so i'm not i'm not the person to ask um I do think I did have somebody reach out to me because I get to be like the bad podcast whisperer because I, I had a bad podcast. So people would be like, what if what if I just did this or what if I what if I all I did was reaction to the, the analysis or whatever? What if I just did that? <laughs> and I'm like, that's awesome. You should do it. 
and, and maybe I'll listen to it, but like you should do, people are always like, Hey, what if I did this? Or what if I just, um, you know, who watches the Watchmen kind of thing. And I'm like, yeah, that's, adult. you know, if you want to do it, like, I always just tell people, if you want to do it, that's great. But I never listen to any of that, but like, we see the, we see the breakouts and I, I forget who said that really the point of all of these, I mean, it's, it's the first takeification of all of this, where it's just like, the point is to have the viral clip, to have the breakout 45 seconds that they can put on a tweet or whatever, but it's not. I just imagine it'd be really boring listening to all of that. But I do, I, I do feel like specifically with Teague. Well, here's what happens. Here's what happens with the player podcasts. I just told you that I don't listen to them. It, it becomes, then they just get in media cycles. So it's like Jeff Teague started saying whatever, but you know, he's, he started, we were like, wow, how self-deprecating. Like we really, we fell in love with Jeff Teague on the group project quote, right? Um, yes. Game sinks against the Hawks, but like we fell in love with him for that one thing. But then it turns out we wanted like a little bit of Jeff Teague. We didn't want so much of Jeff Teague. And so after Jeff Teague like perceives that now he's just in the media, then he's got to say something else crazy. He's got to say Kobe is the greatest player in American sports in the last 50 years. They just have to, they just have to start escalating. They have to say something else. They just have to have to say more and more. And they're basically just in the Nick Wright cycles of like takesmanship. And I really, I guess I just, I, I can't think there was going to be a, I was so mad, bro. Like three sports mad three months ago. And I wanted to make like a 10 minute video about, I can't believe Draymond green is on my TV screen. Like I can't think of anybody less likable uh, for being, I think he's a much greater player than some certain people think he is, but like, like there are certain people that are so unlikable, like the, the anti Charles Barkley but Draymond is going to have a long media career. And like Reggie Miller's had a long media career. And like Chris Weber was on forever. Like there's a lot of people that you are just kind of neutral and or don't like, and they're going to have media careers. And like, that's cool. But it's not really the old model, which is like, boy, Michael Irvin's colorful. And he's going to say wacky stuff on whatever ESPN show he is. And then we see the clip of him saying, what are you going to do? And it's like really funny. And you're like, wow, that, Shannon Sharp, right? Wow, these guys are really animated in a way that I enjoy. If it's just some rando saying the same thing everyone else is, which is like people don't appreciate how great Kobe is. No, to answer your question, that's not saving sports either. The the I didn't really want to talk about player podcasts that much. I think they're completely Sorry. unlistable. I think that no, it's no, it's all right. This yeah, yeah. I had it in there for but I, I want to tie it back to the myth making, right? So you you Jeff T insert literally any player you want. I don't want to hear about this legendary practice battle, this thing, or and also like with Jeff Teague, I remember specifically listening to a podcast and him. He, it's not like he was dogging on Milwaukee or like on Giannis or whatever, but as soon as you start like coming for the people or the places that I think are important, it, it, again, just for him, it's the end of his career. It's, he doesn't really care. He's just trying to make money, get a ring or whatever. Like, okay, the, his estimation goes down. And he's just being honest, but I, I don't want to hear that. I don't need to hear that. I wasn't asking to hear that. I Don't tell me about, you know, this player was legendary in practice. Like I, that's knowledge that you can tell me, but I'll never, I'll never understand that. I'll never have actually been there. Like you can shoot the shit, shoot the breeze. There we go with your uh, buddies yeah. on the podcast, but, uh, but yeah. I don't know. And it's also fundamentally, I don't believe that it's true. Like, so there's a certain kind of clown and he seems like a really, just to put it, use him as an example, there's a certain kind of funny guy who is like, man, we were down 2-0 to Brooklyn and we were done. Well, mm -hmm. so, so every sports book is like this, where they summarize, like I've been reading this Phil Jackson book for like the last year. And so the funniest quote for a two week tour of 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 you know the the phil jackson lakers or the bulls like if jordan was like you know will purdue you shouldn't be named after a big 10 school that that's the entirety of like that that quote is representative because it's like a, a sound bite but that's not really representative of the month that they spent in march 1990 necessarily it's just the best quote right so i don't believe given you know pj and all the guys in that locker room that people were really like done after 2-0 obviously there was an aspect of it but it goes back to there's a reason we used to have writers to craft these narratives because it exactly. is ultimately like it's also a myth but it's more true 
because obviously they got up off the mat and they really wanted to win. Obviously, Giannis and Chris and all those guys really cared. So in a fleeting moment, of course, like if you put yourself on the 15 man on the bench, of course, you're like, man, I can't believe it feels like we're done. But Jeff Teague making a joke, it's true, but it's not really true. And he's not, I'm not saying he's lying or any of these guys, but they're just looking at stuff from their own perspective to tell a better story. But I think it's just any big man on campus, any athlete or any, the nature of their stories are bigger whoppers. There's a certain kind of whopper that a sports writer tells. It's not the same kind of whopper that a player tells. And and, and that's, yeah, that's, I, I'm just agreeing with what you said about that. I, I, don't, I don't, there's certain stuff I don't want to hear. If it's true, I want to hear it. But I tend not to believe a lot of that. Yeah. All right. How do we fix superhero media? We're at an hour. We're going to pivot. I'm going to try and start uh, flying through here. A couple of the other questions. It, maybe it doesn't need fixing. I don't consume superhero media. What do we need, no, it needs need to do to fix it, Kyle? How do we fix I don't know it? what Kyle thinks about this. I think we need to reduce it. I truly, okay, I think it's two things. One, there's too much. There's simply too much. Like, I don't need a Marvel TV series for a character that was introduced to this movie. That's And then we're not going to revisit this character until two, three movies or two, three shows from now. And I need, like, what I really liked about, like, Shang-Chi is that was just like a simple, this is a superhero. This is his backstory. This is what he's facing. And we're done. I didn't need to watch like all these other movies to figure it out. I think the problem is Marvel realized, oh, what we did with the Infinity War saga, that was a hit. We got to find a way to replicate it. No, it's it kind of goes back to the same thing with the Warriors Dynasty. You can't do it. So I think we need to, A, reduce the amount of stuff that it takes. And I don't need to be able to follow it. And B, I just think like, we're just trying to do too many superheroes and a lot of them don't matter. Like when you think about superheroes that matter, it's Superman, it's Batman, it's Spider-Man, the X-Men. Like those are probably like the big four of like superheroes everyone cares about. And then you could start getting into like the Hulk, the Fantastic Four, like the Flash, Wonder Woman. Then you can start getting to the, but I think the problem is now we're just like throwing like a someone from like deep, deep comic book lore that we really don't that people didn't care about even in the comic book time. We're really not like, I really don't know how much, like, like I said, Shang Chi was like an exception to that, but I think there's just too many that we're trying to make work. And also we're trying there. It's too much of like trying to build this whole universe. Like, I just want to watch superhero. Like, I just want to watch the superhero go and do something and have a good time. And I don't need to like worry about like watching a Disney plus series and watch eight episodes because then I'm going to have to end up watching something like Secret Evasion and I'm going to hate it. Did you, I always feel like Riley doesn't watch any of this. He, he, he's he got such a cr- curious mind, but you don't watch a thing. And even when I'm, did, did you guys watch, Kyle, did you watch Andor? I didn't. Yes. Watch I didn't. Oh. Riley, you, uh, so I'll just say <laughs> you and, you and, no, no, you in particular would like it. Because it's, I think it's, it's, from what I've heard from you and others, yes, it sounds like it would be up my alley for sure. It's 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 immaculate storytelling. Yeah. It's 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 um it's every bit of I don't want to spoil any bit. And again, I'm probably overselling it at this point, but it's just it's just so smart. So to answer your question, and if this was rapid fire, everything's been done. This happened with the musicals. This happened with the Westerns. The, 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 you do it for a decade and everything's been said and it got played out. And I don't know. I, I'm only going by like one twit picks or something. So I could be wrong about this. But I think they said the Spider-Verse, maybe, they do, maybe they're kind of going back to uh, Spider-Verse 3. Maybe they're going back to um, rewrite it all and just kind of basically start tearing it about, down back to the studs. They did a bunch of stuff and it did, wasn't right or whatever. I, I think... Going back to my old man in this, at, at a certain point, I need the movie to be saying something and it's more about the subtext. And we've seen the subtext of all of these things so many kind of ways. And, and again, for a new generation, but this goes back to the sports conversation for a new generation. You kind of have to start with something that's not as violent and more sunny and work your way up to the dark night or work your way up to you have to you have to start you need your you need Christopher Reeves. 
like the 1977, 78, whenever that was, uh, Superman leads directly to the Dark Knight. Like that's one concentric circle of like kind of storytelling from the most idealistic kind of basically almost could have been G-rated kind of stuff to to like basically like this big 9-11 analogy. Everything has been done though. So like a new generation could take a spin, but it's kind of like more like 007 where like they do four movies and then some, and then they basically do like a soft reboot. And then what is, what does James Bond mean for our troubled times now? And that's kind of a more sustained, but we're talking about four or five, three or four. I think would Dalton get two? Like we're, that's um, two or three or four movies. And then they tear it down and start over versus all those Marvel movies. And I did not. And so it's interesting because I did not see Shang-Chi. And at a certain point, you just stop watching it. And I walked in Secret Wars and they had like an AI generated opening credits. And I'm like, I'm out, you know, <laughs> and, and then I walked in. You know what the most the most. OK, I'll shut up. The most interesting thing about Secret Wars is that's Elijah Price and Elijah Price's mom playing a romantic couple 20 years later. His mom at the end of that movie is Will's auntie from Fresh Prince, who is his mother. I forget if she's, no, he, she's his mother aged up and aged back from the greatest movie of all time, Unbreakable. And hmm. and then they're like dating. And I forget if they're if she's a scroll or whatever. I, I walked in and out of the room, but I'm like, oh, that's uh, that's his mom. And now... Cause Sam Jackson has always been 55, but now I think he's 75 and, and yeah, but that's, that's to answer your question. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a wrap. Okay. It's over for superhero media. It's probably for the best. Okay. Best uniforms yep. and pro sports currently belong to Kyle. <laughs> Kyle has a collection. It's true. Unless you're asking. Uh, me. <laughs> honestly, the flamingos. I, or whatever. What is that? No, no, they're doing too much lately. Um, mm -hmm. Pittsburgh Steelers. I don't know what it is. I feel like all the Pittsburgh teams, I think part of it is I was literally just in Pittsburgh. So maybe it's just like the connection, but it's just a simple yet really iconic look. Like I can see it. It's like, oh, that's a Pittsburgh. I can see black and yellow. It's like, that's a Pittsburgh team. I don't even know. I don't even know what sport. Mm -hmm. I just know that team's playing. That team's from Pittsburgh. Yep. So I think the Steelers in particular, just because also like with the helmet, I always thought it was kind of cool that they had like the logo on only one of the sides. Yes. So I, I would say Pittsburgh, primarily oh. the Steelers. It almost feels like the answer if you include, because Pittsburgh was my number one when I did that video uh, for, the, for the NFL. But it almost feels like if you say all sports, then you start thinking of kind of 10 teams. And it almost feels like if I had to pick one, because now I'm picking from all the sports, then I feel like the answer is the Raiders just because you're thinking of something that's that much more singular is like, I don't think it, it's kind of hard to pick a single football team, but I almost feel like it should be even more stripped down. So of course you're thinking of the Yankees. It doesn't feel right to pick the Celtics and because Celtics, because Celtics Lakers Knicks are kind of like this, this Trinity of kind of looks the, it's, it's kind of hard to pick one. And I almost feel like the, feel like the red bulls like when they when the bulls were like stripped down in the 90s like the red version of the bulls is the best but i think actually if you had to pick one it answers the raiders final answer i think i also I, will I, give honorable i was gonna say i'll give honorable mention to the toronto maple leaves because yeah. it is very much a this is the it's look a, that's a nice it's always going to be a look and we're not changing it and if we are we're doing a slight modification but like this is what we're going with and that's always been the case even though i do not like the toronto maple leaves they have a yeah. look. It, when I wrote this up, I the first thing that just popped in mind was the Steelers as well. It, it, and I don't wow. think about it nearly as much as you guys, but Steelers was the when I just sat there, I was like, it's probably the Steelers. Like, cause it's I don't know, I don't track a lot of the uniform shenanigans in the NFL. I know the Packers have the all white look that they're doing, and they had the color rush, not the Packers, but the NFL. But I don't know how much modifications they do, the Steelers do year over year to the uniforms. I can't imagine a lot because every time I tune in, it looks like the exact same uniform I've been watching since I was whatever, four years old when I first started watching football. So somebody should make a video about block numbers. The dolphins were playing when I came in here and the dolphins are wearing their throwbacks tonight. And it's just the block it's, block. Isn't the term. I don't think, but just the regular plain Jane high school numbers and the, the rate, the, the Steelers used to have that in the Bradshaw era. And then they kind of went to like a, I mean, it's not literally aerial, but kind of a more rounded kind of number. Uh, but yeah, block numbers, like old school numbers with 
white numbers with the black border or whatever the case really, really works for me. So. Okay. Next question. Were the Lazaris, the Lazari clan, were they the secret sauce? Were they over keeping the, the whole, whole boat afloat? I thought this was funny, but I didn't understand this question. What's it? With... You know, I, I when I actually I think about it, though, after... <laughs> what? hold on, hold on. When you think yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah, it for me, Kyle. Land the plane, land the plane. I just put the plane together. Now you got to land it for me. You think about Mark Lazary, and apparently he was like the big mouth with the whole Bogdan, Drew Holiday, like stuff. Apparently it's Lazary, even though no one could prove it. You had Alex Lazary constantly tweeting about how bad the officiating was. You had all of this aspect, and I feel like once Alex Lazary tried to slime and grift his way into trying to run for the Senate out of Wisconsin, he stopped tweeting. That stopped happening. Mark Lazary starts not saying as much. He's not as he's not courtside. It feels like Wes Enos was, is more like the okay, this is actually my team. I don't know, like maybe, but I feel like it was much more like, oh, I know who these people are because Alex Lazary is constantly tweeting about the wrestling. I'm like, yes, I agree. <laughs> I agree with you. Do you think and then people uh, were th thirsting over both of the oh wait, that was the Edens. I was gonna say, and then people's thirsting yeah. over the daughters, but that was Edens, not Lazarus. Big up to her for for kind of staying out of the spotlight for the most part. Cause at at the time, and again, it was, of course I would never objectify women if you recall that draft. There was another attractive king's daughter or, or niece or something that I thought was a show stunner and everybody was talking about the blonde, which is neither here nor there. What I wanted to say, though, do you think Alex Lazary is like, how dare ya? Like, I held up a mirror. I was one of you. I held up a mirror. I was exactly the same as Shafty Bro tweets or any of these dudes. I was the, I was the same guy. I acted just like you. I was... And, and you turn on me like everybody hated him. And he was like the median bucks, Twitter user. Like, <laughs> like if, 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 if his such name, a good point. he probably does feel hard done. in. it's yeah. yeah. The uh, problem <laughs> is he should not have done all this to try and then go for Senate. If he had just continued doing it, I think people would have been fine because he was a representative of what bucks Twitter was, but then it's like, Oh, I'm going to use this plus my dad's money. And I'm actually going to run for Senate. And the last thing you're going to, and I don't want to get political, but like, yeah, you can't be some dude from New York trying to connect with Wisconsin people. It's not going to happen. It's different, it's, right? You can't do it. I, I've never thought about that till just now, but really it's like he held up a mirror to the rest of them. But if, he, if he was, uh, Bledsoe fan one two three four. He could have just fit in. He would have camouflaged perfectly with us. He was totally one of. I mean, he wasn't. I don't feel like I particularly got down like that. But he was unctuous and said too much and really, really cared and seemed really happy to be here. As I just reflect on it now, and I didn't like him, but I always feel like I felt like people were kind of handsy with him. People took liberties with him. And then those who had kind of were higher up on the echelon were like, you know, I'm a fourth rate blogger or whatever. And, and I'm going to tweet angrily. There's one guy. Well, I don't want to tell the story. But yeah, I, I do feel like he, I feel like he was one of us. And we were like, no, actually, we hate ourselves. And that's that's what happened to Alexander Lazarus. I'm just saying, if Herb Cole, if Herb Cole had a son and he was doing this, I think we'd all be like, yeah, OK, whatever. You're cool. Because it's like. <laughs> That is a Wisconsinite. That like you, we know your dad. Your dad is Herb Cole. R.I.P. You're his son. You can tweet all this. We'll never turn on you, even if you decide to run for Senate. But it's like you just you're from out of town. It felt like you were. It, it was just more of like a, okay, we get it, we agree. But now you're like almost grifting. See, the the thing with Alex is he was quite obviously never the power behind the throne. So that's why no. Mark was always very interesting because the power behind the throne came out every once in a while to talk shop on CNBC or whatever, you know, business network he was doing media deals with. The I guess I didn't really have a purpose to the question, but I find that's it great. interesting that the, the, the changeover, like, okay, Mark Lazary, he might've had bad ideas as far as like basketball team building, or maybe they were good ideas. I mean, the Brogdon thing. We won a title, right? So I guess he was ultimately vindicated by saying we're not going to pay the tax for that guy. Um, <laughs> shut up, Kyle. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but I, I just wonder, like, organizationally, a, like, and I don't know, who knows? Maybe Edens is like this. Maybe uh, what's his face? The Browns owner, uh, whose name? Uh, Haslam. Oh, Haslam. Maybe he's, Haslam. 
maybe Junior Bridgman's going to be this way, but like who who's really the decisive decision maker? Is it all just John Horst? Is is John Horst just freestyling out there? Is it now Doc Rivers? Like it feels like to me the difference between having the Lazarus and not having them is more so th- there's never been a really strongly defined direction of the team or like strong decision you could claim you could say like okay train for damian Lillard. that's a strong decision of course but like that that kind of just happens sort of freestyle they didn't have a plan mm-hmm. after that so i just wonder if missing that guy and the, the i'm sure the conflict that he may have had butting heads with like front office with the other owners not enough to like blow up the franchise but does that conflict missing that reduce the product that we see on the court in some sort of way that's kind of what i'm wondering there well, honestly, the, I think it's Edens. I think Edens has always been the one calling the shots in that regard. Because we got to remember the whole GM search. That was Edens basically saying, "No, I don't care." Yeah, but that was that I'm was kind of more of a that was more of a quirk of timing because he was like the guy who could do the. But I feel like it's always time. been that way, though. Yeah. But but uh, back to kind of what you were saying before. Um, for us in that time period, I, it it got old after two or three years, but. No one ever thought the Bucks were going to win a championship or be in an Eastern Conference Finals or make it to the second round. But all of a sudden, we've got this superstar coach and all this palace intrigue. And it seemed unique and special. And I know that that got my creative juices going in the early days of me making these videos where I was like, I'm going to make some of these videos that are kind of like documentaries in a way because there was all these little bits. Because that coming out of Stern wasn't what the NBA showed you. And it only got shown if, like, I think there's a thought, there was a thinking in that time period. LeBron James does this kind of stuff, but like the Wizards aren't doing this. And I don't think we really had a grasp that basically every NBA team is kind of run by this shadowy, like an agent gets power. And like, I didn't know Rob Palenka was Kobe's agent. Like, there's a lot of stuff you just don't know. You follow the league, but I don't know this stuff. And you're like, Oh, so the super agents kind of become GMs and they kind of go back and there's no really tell, you know, it's, it's, it's all kind of shady. And then like, um, the one big agency, you know, not clutch the one CAA kind of runs half the league and they, they leak the Woj and somebody else leaks the Shams. I don't think we knew it. We don't know now, but I don't think we knew, but I think we thought that was for big stuff. That was for Durant kind of guys. And we didn't think the bucks were going to do anything, but all of a sudden there was all this interesting stuff happening. And it was interesting. Which owner do you like the most? Like, I don't think that was ever a topic, but it's like, well, this one's just, the, the, you know, almost like the Godfather. Like, this one's the Michael quiet one in the background, and this one's the loud mouth, and this one has political aspirations, and this one has the hot daughter, and this one this. And it was really interesting, right, for like three years. And, and, oh, they, and they had Clinton connections, and there was all this stuff. And like, why do we have um, Obama's brother-in-law or whatever like whatever that was like there was all this stuff taking place and it was really interesting in a way that like betting the parlay i just can't imagine was the same so i kind of liked that era but looking back on it it's funny because we won in 21 and now it just seems so stupid right (laughs) then the other part is like then you had jamie dine and everyone's just like what do you do like what Mm -hmm. why are you here (laughs) Mm -hmm. are you just bankrolling this whole thing actually well at Lazarus Edens to make the decision. You're like, all right, sure. Write a check. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why Junior Bridgman is here to save the day. He's going to give us direction. He's going to bring us back to the promised land. Okay. Final question for you guys sure. before I open it up. If there's anything else that we want to talk about, uh, do we really know what makes a good NBA coach in 2024? Doc Rivers is Kyle's favorite coach uh, of all time. He's a huge fan. Do we, do we, <laughs> Kyle, do you feel like, you know, what makes a good NBA coach in, in the current era? No, because I feel like if you had to ask me, like, oh, who's the best coach in the NBA, I'd probably go Eric Spolstra. But even then, it's like, because I would have been like, okay, I feel like in terms of, like, putting together a strategy, he seems to get more from less than anyone else. But at the same time, it's like, it took two, and maybe I have, it's just two fluke runs that the Heat have recently where they got to the finals because injuries and luck. And really, it's like Miami hasn't really done much outside of those two years. So, like, is he actually that good of a coach? I don't know. I think because we had Budenholzer and he was just kind of like, all right, just go out and vibe. And it won a title. But at the same time, it's like no one is over here saying, like, oh, Mike Budenholzer is a good coach. I think they'd be like, he's fine. And I think there's it's just kind of hard to know, like, what makes a good coach at this point. It's not like 
in college when you had like Coach K and you had like Roy Williams and you had like all these other ones. It's like, all right, this is what they do. This is how they picture it. Or like college football, it's like Nick Saban. Like you could try and pick their brain and understand it. Well, now at the NBA, it's kind of like, I don't know what makes a good coach because I thought David Fisdale would have been a good coach and he didn't do well in New York. And it's like, I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Doc Rivers had this pedigree, but we've also seen not really done much, but at the same time, he keeps getting jobs because everyone's like, well, he did that one thing. Nick Nurse, I don't think he's a good coach, but he does okay. Like, I don't know. I really don't know what makes a good coach because I'm thinking of like the good, quote unquote, good coach. It's like Steve Kerr. Well, I probably would be a good coach too if I had Stephen Clay and Draymond at the prime. Eric Spolstra, two fluke runs to the finals. Maybe I'm imagining it. Like maybe the dude over in Boston, but it's like he also seems to be getting bailed out by, okay, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown hit shots. Tibbs? Is, is Tibbs a good coach? I don't know. <laughs> in the 90s. He just gets dudes to play. Mm-hmm. He, he, yeah, he's like the Scott Skiles, like, oh, we're just going to outwork you, and it works until it doesn't. So I don't know what makes a good coach. So there, there's no, like, way I can, like, define what makes a good coach. I feel like I could just point and be like, yeah, like Popovich is a good coach, I think. At this, I don't know if he's still a good coach, but I'd say Popovich is a good coach. I'd say Kerr is a good – Mike Malone might be. I don't even have a whole lot to add to that. I think everything you say is true. And there is something interesting about, although they say Doc Rivers is kind of a snake too, but I think people don't mind how much he's a snake. He's, he's like sort of a likable snake. Like people think he's a bit of a liar, but they don't mind it too much. But he, I think he has like, but like a bit of a liar, but he's not like Chris Paul despised in the same kind of way. I think there are people who ride for him and and it's very interesting. And again, this this Phil Jackson book that I only read a page at a time on the toilet, so like you get these like you get, get these like kind of nuggets, and, and about how like they would um, I'm not going to tell this story, but but basically like if if you, I think there's people who are great managers of people, and I do think Phil Jackson is the greatest coach of all time in so much as like he held that game together for so long because like you said. We would have laughed at you, Kyle, if if you said in 2020 Nick Nurse wasn't a good coach, wasn't a good coach, or whenever it was 2019 around that time, because it was so clear. But what we found out is none of these guys are actually a good coach for the long haul, and and I just think keeping it real that point guards who played in the league have the longevity to be pretty good coaches for a really long time. And boot the Bootenholzers of the world, not not the Bootenholzer hasn't had a million years to do this, but I think ex players can really manage the egos because I think ultimately it's kind of an ego managing and you have to have the standing to sometimes bend but not break but have the standing to cuss somebody out or to try different stuff in a way that like whoever that guy was who LeBron got fired immediately for the Cavs um uh, oh David Blatt David Blatt right they, they just they just don't have the standing like they're one bad practice away from getting tuned out forever so I think Doc Rivers is a pretty good coach. Is he a championship coach? Who knows? But like, is there a good coach? I I think there's good situations for a couple of years and eventually it all falls apart. But if I wanted to believe the other way, like you said, all those guys are the Phil Jackson tree, like Steve Kerr, all of those guys, like he's the Kerr, he's the, you know, Popovich and Kerr and uh, Jackson tree. But yeah, I don't know. And I think every year it's, every year it's less. It's why, and I, it's not really doesn't matter all that much, but in like our particular space, because in the basket blocking world, like, Oh, X's and O's or whatever. Like if people want to talk about a style of a coach, what are they going to play on the court? And it, and it does matter to a certain extent, but that's so much more determined by the players that you have rather than what the coach wants to do. I mean, you could be Adrian Griffin and he can go rogue with the defense and then you'll be out of a job halfway through your first season or whatever. But um, it, it, I think there's an over indexing of what's this guy's like X's and O's knowledge. One, we don't have a clue. I mean, we can watch like some film from seasons and be like, oh, they're kind of doing this, I guess. And that suggests something. But I think it, like you guys said, it's a lot more about the intangibles rather than are you going to out scheme like Bud <laughs> would get out schemed by other coaches. So it, it, it's not like it doesn't matter, but it, I think it's just. I struggle with evaluating, especially when it's like assistants and stuff or like, oh, this assistant is in for like 
what am I supposed to make of that? How how can I even possibly have any sort of opinion about this guy outside of a an article said from a local basket blogger who might be in with whoever says he's like mm-hmm. a good guy. That's what I got. Yeah. Like, it's just, it's, it's another art form. That's just hard to understand from the outside. I, I think it is even possible to really understand. Okay. I reckless, reckless, part... reckless, reckless story segment real quick. Reckless story. Okay. Right, go, this this go. would be, this will be our breakout. Uh, I forget if I told you guys this story and this is eighth hand, but someone who would know someone in the media told me via DM and he said, I only got one source on it. I didn't source it. Was like with Adrian Griffin, they were kind of had their last straw. Or they had some early meetings before Rivers. But however the story went, I could look at my phone. That they thought they had had kind of an understanding. And then they were like, went downstairs or went to the court. And they thought they were having a practice. And he and one of the assistant coaches was at Potawatomi. And it, and it was like like a last straw. <laughs> like he was like <laughs> at Potawatomi at two thirty in the afternoon gambling or something when they were supposed to be running a practice. And this is a reckless story, although I'm not making this up. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't think I've ever told this. Uh, but either way, it's funny. So again, true, not true. But uh, I always enjoy that story. I feel like I gotta end it there. I I was gonna talk about like Jason Kidd, how people said he was a good coach. I'm still holding out that he's not. We're ending there. <laughs> I'm just picturing him at Pato on like the on the unlimited shrimp or whatever, like the bingo it, night with. It, it's um, so funny. What's the funniest? Is it is it the funniest at the roulette? Like is that kind of because it's the dice? Like what's the funniest? <laughs> I don't even know. Again, I've never been there. I don't know what they have, but it's just it's just hilarious. It's it's funny to me thinking because my brother frequents Pato, uh, so it's just funny to me thinking my brother was was brushing shoulders with Adrian Griffin when when, when Adrian was when when the staff was supposed to be uh, doing a practice. So that's that's an awesome reckless speculation that we're not sure if we're ever going to be able to get verification on, but we appreciate a good uh, Dear Diaries exclusive like that. That wraps up all of my questions I had for you guys. Was there anything we didn't get to that you would like to uh, pick the collective brain? everybody on the on the cast right now we ran over thing okay. i feel like Riley, you're gonna save like the quest you're gonna save all the questions for like when you and me record properly before the season yes starts. yeah we'll we'll run through the we'll see if adam's there but stuff. oh yeah actually let's let's end it on this note we'll we'll just have ben answer kyle you can answer if you like and then change it down the road what do you envision this season what's what's the end result for the bucks Give the prediction for those who don't uh, follow the the YouTube channel. Feeling fo- good? Fo, 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 fo. I, I feel that way every year, though. I mean, it, it's that's what's kind of cool about this. I'm no longer, in, I haven't been interested for a long time in trade kind of stuff. I was listening to another, because again, before you sent me that list this afternoon, I was like, dude, I'm going to get on this show and forget Brooke Lopez's name because I don't really think about this stuff in the off season. And I want, and I'm thinking of random stuff. Like I kind of want to make a video about how clearly Steph Curry is a shooting guard. And I don't know why people are comparing him to Magic Johnson. So like this again, cause I, I'm, I'm the ag- algorithm breaker. Like everything I make is like destined not to go viral. Cause I put stuff up at the wrong time. And <laughs> like, I should have an NFL video out right now. Right. Obviously. Um, but yeah, I'm excited. It, it's the Packers thing. It's it every single year. People thought the Packers had a great, you know, the Packers, had a great quarterback. And so we're in the card game. I'm not interested in once we get going, I'll be interested and I'll be annoyed by the Pacer series and how people are somehow like cool with the Pacer series. Cause certain people, you know, put up numbers or whatever, but like I, I get mad when I talk about it, but ultimately I'm a romantic and I'm an optimist about this team. And when it gets right going, I will be, and if I have time to make a video, I will be making a video about the Dame Lillard Redemption Tour because that's like the kind of stuff I want to believe. Like I want to love this team and get really excited about the Bucks going on a win 20 out of 25 game run kind of, you know, wouldn't that be fun if all of a sudden like we had a great, like I'd be super excited. I'd be super happy for all of that. But until then, like, it's just not worth thinking about till game one anymore. And I don't, I don't care about the trades. I saw 
whichever one of the AJs we just drafted dunk on somebody in, in some gym. And I thought that was kind of fun where, but I it just, I can't care about this kind of stuff the same way I did when I was 21, but when the season comes around, yeah, I'll go, you know, go bucks. Well, it's been a lot of fun. This is a good podcast. We really appreciate both of you guys' times. It was meandering, but I think it hit a lot of the topics that I really wanted to get to with both of you guys. So, uh, Kyle, we'll have you back on within probably for a couple more interviews and then for our decompress at the end of this. Uh, it's Tatonia Worlds on YouTube. That's the best place to find at David Dunn 21 on Twitter. If you think a lot of uh, the thoughts shared today are worthy of further exploration on social media, that's where you can find it. Uh, any other plugs? Anybody? I'm on. I'm on. I couldn't. Congrats I can't. to Adam. Yeah, good. Yeah. Go, go right ahead. I, I'm also on T public now for my designs that I can't get through to Tony world.com. So you can check out some of that now, but if you, even, even more than looking on the YouTube channel, if you, if you Google 2021 bucks, or if you on YouTube, Google 2021 bucks championship, I'm still probably like the third video from the top. Or it's, and that's kind of out of all the stuff I've done that I'm probably the proudest of. And that's still like it's dope, man. Like you can t like it still feel like it gets ten views every hour. Like there's always some Bucks fan watching it when you I kind of look at my phone, and that's like kind of why we do this stuff. But yeah, if you know who I am, like, and for some reason, so here's what I will say: even more than like, even more than like, go and buy a T-shirt or a mug for me, which is like cool, but like I appreciate that, but like whatever. If you're not subscribed. And if you're not subscribed on your wife's phone and on your baby mama's phone, if you're not like everybody who's listening to this should be subscribed to me 10 different ways. That's kind of like more what I'm into. And so if you can do that for me, I would appreciate that. But in all seriousness, like um, I think I said this at the top, but man, appreciate appreciate kind of our, our, our wacky Internet friendship through the years. I appreciate having me on. And and I you know, periodically DM you guys like, Hey, did you see this? Or what do you think of this or any of this kind of stuff like that? And I appreciate it. It's, it's been, it's been, again, it feels like three years, but I guess it's been 10 years. Right. But well, yeah, the it's a wild mutual. concept. Yeah. Yeah. The <laughs> yeah. feelings mutual. It's been a lot of fun over the years and uh, it's, it's fun to bounce ideas off of both of you guys. It's fun to bounce ideas off you, Ben, because you're usually cooking up something a little bit more off the wall, which we appreciate. So we'll wrap it up there. Appreciate you guys' times. Uh, if you're listening to this podcast, you can also find it on uh, a version of it on YouTube. Like, subscribe there as well to Tony World first, then come over to Brew Hoop. Subscribe on Brew Hoop as well. Um, share it with your friends, et cetera, et cetera. And we will talk to you again very soon.